Hi everybody, Max Locato here from my home to yours. I hope you're having a good day. If you're not having a good day, I hope something is said that will improve your day. We're continuing our discussion on anxiety and some of the thoughts today come out of a book I wrote called Anxious for Nothing. Now, if you cannot stay around, uh, let us know how to pray for you. Just post your prayer needs right there in the comment section and we would be honored to pray for you. If you have a few minutes, I'm thinking six minutes, we're going to take a look at Philippians 4.4. 4. The Apostle Paul says that we deal with anxiety by rejoicing in the Lord always. Not just on paydays, not just on Fridays, not just on good days, not just on birthdays. But we rejoice in the Lord every day, always. Do you hear that word always in arch and eyebrow? Always, Lakato from the hospital bed, always from the unemployment office, from the funeral home. I mean, it's one thing to rejoice in the Lord when life is good, but when the odds are against you, you know who could relate to that question? Joseph, the Old Testament hero. Now he predated the apostle Paul by you know, 20 centuries, but both knew the challenge of imprisonment. The Apostle Paul wrote those words in prison. Joseph knew life in prison. He was, as you might remember, sold into slavery by his brothers. Then he was wrongly accused of making sexual advances toward his master's wife. Joseph was then thrown in jail. His prison was dark. His prison was dank. His prison was a dungeon of underground windowless rooms, stale food, bitter water. He had no way out and he had no one to help him, no friend to help him. Now, he thought he did. He thought he had a friend. He thought he had befriended two men from Pharaoh's court and that they would help him. One was a butler. The other was a baker. Both were troubled by their dreams. And Joseph had a knack, an ability for dream interpretation, and he offered to help. He had bad news for the baker. He said, get your affairs in order. Uh, you're going to die. And he had good news for the butler. He said, get your bags packed. You're going back to the palace, back to Pharaoh. Joseph asked the butler to put in a good word for him with Pharaoh, and the butler agreed to do so. Joseph's heart no doubt raced. His hopes soared. He kept an eye on the jail door, expecting to be rescued, to be released any minute. The butler, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him, forgot him entirely. So had everyone else, it seemed. Joseph's story is one of abandonment. Joseph's story is one of a person languishing in prison. In fact, he languished for two more years with no word and no solution. Two years, plenty of time to give up, plenty of time for the world to turn gray, plenty of time for the gargoyles of dread to appear, plenty of time to wonder, is this how God treats his children? Is this God's reward for good behavior? Do your best, and this is what you get, a jail cell, a hard bed, friends who forget you. Now, if Joseph asked such questions, we don't know. But if you ask those questions, friend, you're not alone. You're not alone. Today, you might be asking, is God even aware of what I'm going through? Does he care? Does he know? And the answer is yes. Our God is personally, our God is powerfully involved in his creation. He is the one, the scripture says, who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He's the one who sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Those are Jesus' words, Matthew 5, 45. God is the one who feeds the birds, the one who watches the sparrows, Matthew 6 and verse 26 and 10 and verse 29. He's the one in charge of everything, even down to the details of our lives. So we ask, if God is in charge, why was Joseph in prison? Why does God permit challenges to come our way? Would not an almighty God prevent them? Not if they serve his higher purpose. Remember the rest of Joseph's story? 
When Pharaoh was troubled by his dreams, the butler recalled Joseph's ability and Joseph's request. He mentioned Joseph to Pharaoh and as fast as you can say providence, Joseph went from prison to palace. Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, which was a forecast of a famine. Pharaoh promoted Joseph to prime minister and Joseph successfully navigated the crisis and he saved, well, not just the Egyptians, but he also saved the family of his father, Jacob. Years later, Joseph would tell his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Oh, a verse worth memorizing, Genesis 50, 20. Two words at the heart of this passage reveal the heart of providential hope. But God, but God, you intended to harm me, but God, what was intended as harm became good in the hands of a good God. Why? Because Joseph kept God in the middle of his circumstance. Joseph viewed the sufferings of his life through the lens of divine providence and sovereignty. Can I urge you? Can I beg you to do the same? If you don't, anxiety will stalk you every day of your life. If the story of Joseph teaches us anything, it is this. We have a choice. We can wear our hurt or we can wear our hope. We can outfit ourselves in our misfortune or we can clothe ourselves in God's providence. We can cave in to the pandemonium of life or we can lean into the perfect plan of our loving God and we can believe this promise. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8 and verse 28. And my friend, that promise is for you. Have a great day. And don't forget who gave it to you.